Hi, welcome to True Blue History. I'm your host, Adam Bloom. Come with me behind the lines as we explore all things military history. On today's show, we have a special guest um, uh, all the way from Belgium. Um, is my good friend, uh, Simon Luigi. And Simon works at a very special place that was um, very close to the World War One troops. And it was uh, at Talbot House. And he joined us on the show today to just tell us a little bit about how Talbot House, how it uh, came into fruition and what the, um, what Talbot House, what it does, if it still exists today and what it does. And he joins us on the show all the way from Belgium. So, Simon, thank you for joining us. Hi, Adam. Good evening to you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank, no, thank you for coming on, mate. I, I appreciate you uh, giving up your, t- your time and um, to have a discussion about um, Talbot House. So, can you just tell our listeners what Talbot House was and um, what it is today? If you could just um, give us a little brief uh, summary of uh, what what Talbot House and who was uh, behind Talbot House? And yeah, sure, sure. I'd love to. Uh take you on a tour of Talbot House but uh, due to this whole pandemic thing we're also closed so uh, I'm talking to you from home this place is called Anzac House 100 years ago so it is appropriate for the show let's say. Now Talbot House uh, was and is a home from home that's as simple as you can uh, sum it up. Now um, 100 years ago the town we're located in Poperinge or Pops is located a good 10 kilometers behind the front line of Ypres, Ypres, Ypres. I'm sure your listeners have heard of. Yep. So we're located 10, 15 kilometers behind the front line. So Pops was the garrison town. It's where the soldiers, you know, had their camps, their hospitals. We had 12 railway stations, five airfields. And also when they had a day off and they did get some time off, obviously, it was the only place they could get to. Now you have to imagine Pops being uh, this small suburb somewhere in the bush with nothing whatsoever. Uh, that that's pops, you know. Uh, it wasn't mentioned in any of the tourist guides at the time, but it suddenly grew from ten thousand inhabitants to quarter of a million, and all the Tommies and and the Aussies enjoyed uh, their liberties uh, quite a bit, let's say. Uh, so every second house became a pub or a shop. Uh, anything you can imagine was put on sale. Anything. Uh, there were 12 movie theaters, lots of gambling going on, lots of prostitution as well. Um, let, let's say we won't put the figure on how many Aussies went home with one of those interesting diseases, but it was a good percentage. Uh, it's also something uh, well that the, the town was famous for. But the, the problem was it got a lot of men into hospital and the uh, army commanders insisted that some healthy entertainment was provided for the men so they gave the padres of the british army the job of creating an alternative so away from the booze away from the women away from the gambling uh, and still try and make it a success you know and i think that's what they accomplished because 100 years on the sole club still standing on the western front is Talbot house so um and why that is well i'll, I'll love to tell you a bit about that on the podcast but the reason why Talbot House uh, uh, became the number one really uh, is all down to the house rules and the way it was run and the man behind all of that. Yeah wrong mate that sounds um, interesting so can you can you um, tell the listeners um, so who was the man behind Talbot House and what was his vision and why why did he want to create? um, Yeah sure sure so uh, the guy who founded Talbot House, uh, well, there were actually two of them, uh, two padres, Neville Talbot, but the, the real pioneer is uh, Philip Byard Clayton, another padre uh, nicknamed Tubby. That's how he's universally known. That's how he's known in Australia as well, uh, Tubby Clayton. Now, um, and Tubby uh, came from a mother's family, actually born in Australia, in Maryborough. So he lived in Australia only for a year or two uh, before the family moved back to, to England. But he was very proud of his Australian connection. He, he abused it whenever he could, uh, with Aussies especially. Yes. Um, and the, the way he, well, he was a doctor in theology. Uh, only 30 years old, he was younger than me. Uh, I can't imagine someone with that mental power doing what he did, really, at that age. Um, 
So what did he do? He uh, rented the house from a local hot merchant and a banker. Um, he never negotiated the price. He just uh, thought the army is going to pay anyhow, and they ended up having to do that. And uh, he had to come up with a name. So he was going to dub it Church House. So halfway through writing the letters on the canvas, he was stopped by a, a colonel who passed and pulled him over and said, come on, there's a, I'm closing you down. Uh, you, you know, you name it after the people who want to visit, you know, your audience. So they ended up naming it after a young lieutenant, a 21-year-old bloke, Gilbert Talbot, who's buried a few miles from here at Sanctuary Wood at Hoosh, uh, another uh, Australian uh, battlefield. Now, um, the one thing that really stands out is what he did from then onwards, the house rules. Everything was segregated. Australians were kept out of the town center for as much as possible uh, for one reason or another. Um, there was always stuff going on, same you know, with other nationalities. In Talbot House, everyone was allowed in. It doesn't matter if you were a field marshal, the Prince of Wales, or a minor you know, from um, Ballarat anyone was allowed to to experience and, and join him and uh, I'd like to tell you if, if, you, if you allow me a great story of um, a great Aussie story uh, in that regard it's uh, winter 1916 and um, this Australian sergeant has been walking um, from his camp to Paris now he thought you know poppering it having the nickname little Paris the real thing can't be far behind right so he starts walking walking and eventually he gets stopped by this uh, fancy motorcade opens the window and general plumer himself commander of second army uh pulls the the aussie sergeant over and gives him a ride not to paris but to talbot house and he calls down uh tubby clayton who was you know again ne never in proper uniform chubby didn't care didn't bother and uh, says right tubby this is my guest Please look after him. So can you imagine a British general going all the way out of his way to pick up an Australian sergeant, giving him a ride, getting him fed and a bed for the night? It's Talbot House. Everyone is allowed in and treated equally. And General Plumer really insisted on that. It was one of his best memories of, of the whole war, he said. One of the best things he ever witnessed in his whole career for morale. The fact that everyone at one place could be treated equally. Wow, that's that's an amazing that that's so. I, I, I'm sitting here, you know, and it's it's hard to it's hard to believe, you know, that 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 story was, you know, like it's it's an every man's club, and you know, everyone's treated fairly. Which you know that that especially in those times, especially with the the different in class system that that, yeah. that was, um, you know, it was there, and you know, like you had you had very. You had the upper class, you had the middle class, and then you had the very, you know, you had the low class. So for that to be, you know, I, I, for the envision that um, that they had, mate, that's 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 great to hear. You know that everyone, you know, from from a general right down to a private, they're treated with the utmost and equal respect. And you know, yes. that, that's it's you know, and I guess that's why the troops loved going to Talbot House, and that would have, you know, that would have been right through the front, they, they, the word would have spread about Talbot House. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so it was, um, so was it, um, was it ever bombed? Was Talbot House ever, was it obviously being so close to the front lines, was it ever, was there any damage ever sustained in, uh, from the war? Yeah, yeah, sure, there was. Uh, so the primary reason why the owner rented it to the British Army to start with in December 1915 is because the house had been hit. Um, it also uh, sustained uh, a few other bits and pieces of damage. Uh, there were air raid shelters, well, cellars underneath Talbot House that were often used as well. Uh, we only luckily know of one fatality. The Canadian soldier, still unknown to us, we we're still trying to figure out who it actually was. Got some people giving us a hand with that, but uh, we're kind of stuck on a good 10 names for now. But only one fatality. And on one day in 1917, the house was packed with over, well, 2,000 people in the garden, in the house. Um, they started shelling, um, and well, there, there could have been mass casualties. 
uh, the, it was a miracle, Tabi said, you know, he's a priest, you know, everything's a miracle to him. Uh, one guy was uh, shortening a stick and he cuts in his finger as the only injury sustained that day. So, um, but th there's a, another story, a, gr a great story. Um, on the side of the house, we have um, uh, a room. Today, it's one of the bathrooms of the guest house. And it's, uh, has, it bears a German name. Tabby said that we had a German visitor. What an honor. We really ought to name the room after him. Uh, 5.9 is the caliber of the German shell that came through the wall. Uh, wow. We thought it was quite you know, appropriate to name the room. Um, so uh, 5.9 room. You can still see today in the chapel, the floorboards have a different shape in that section because they had to be replaced by the engineers. So... Um, you know, when he was in his chapel, uh, the, you have to know the chapel is three flights up, three stories up. And when you look out, you can almost see beyond Popperinge. Uh, you can see where the camps would have been on the, on the way to the front line. It's, um, let's say, a very dangerous place. The floor also, the boards were never designed to keep people, really. It was storage uh, more than anything uh, and laundry. Now, uh, the engineers forbade him time and time again to put the chapel up. He consulted with uh, sappers and he went all the way up to the, uh, to the colonel of the Royal Engineers. And all of them said, you're mad, you can't be doing this. So in the end, he said, I, I stopped asking anyone and we went along with the plan anyway. So 120 men were squeezed on that tiny, tiny chapel of Talbot House uh, and 20 more on the stairs several times a day. And the congregation was drilled in successive, uh, successive movements. So when half had to kneel, the other half had to get up because otherwise someone would be pushed out of the window. There wasn't enough space. So, um, you know, that, that's tubby. But in 1918, he, he left me a quote that I, I put on our social media yesterday. He said, um, it's like Niagara Falls. We, uh, you know, behind Niagara Falls, we, we don't get any of the water. We don't get any of the shells. But uh, it is deafening. So in 1918, the house was forced closed as well. And uh, it became a very tight squeeze, let's say. Uh, you could hardly see the house because it was covered entirely in sandbags to protect it. But uh, it took them a month to force him out. He wouldn't leave, you know. He neglected one order after the other for a whole month. He defied the British authorities and they kept the club open. Preparing wow. one day, he said breakfast for the Kaiser when he was only five miles away. So uh, you couldn't stop the man. <laughs> So with, um, in 19, so for our listeners, obviously people know with the, um, with the spring offensive that um, when the Germans launched their spring offensive, um, yes. did Talbot House stay open and did it, um, did it like once the Germans uh, were in Pompeii, did they, did Talbot House move or did it, did it um, close for a certain period and then um, once, once the Allies came back through, was it, um, was Talbot House opened again, or what actually happened to Talbot House in once the Germans launched their spring offensive? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, we put a, a whole video with all our archive footage of that period on our social media yesterday. So it's called uh, "Shut Up," um, because that's what Tubby said to all the orders. Um, so um, they pinned notices to the door, you know, the the officers, and saying "Shut up, Tubby," you know, leave the place, close down. And he replied, shut up yourself. Um, so it took them a month to finally get rid of him. Uh, well, rid of him. He um, uh, scrounged four Armstrong huts, wooden huts. And he pitched them um, only a mile or two away at a place called La Lovi, um, which uh, was a chateau. He never got near the chateau. You know, that wasn't his thing. He pitched it near an aerodrome, near, near an airfield. And he put the Talbot House sign next to it. And uh, he continued in Talbot House Park. He dubbed it Dingley Dell. And uh, he expected to be there a month or two. He ended up being there several months. Um, but he, and he made regular uh, trips backwards and forwards to check on the house to salvage the cat as well. Uh, but he, uh, he would not quit. So he kept on going uh, because he believed, rightly so, that there was a great need for spiritual help for a home from home for that kindness. And um, you might wonder how he was allowed to do all that because they were short of, of staff, you know, of padres, of anything, you know. Uh, but he, he had made so many friends in low and high places by that stage that no, no one could touch him. Uh, they, he just kept going. Um, 
And when the war drew to an end, he had fallen in love with that hut. He'd stayed in so much. You know, the hut is the size of, of four toilet cubicles. Uh, it's nothing. Uh, he took it home with him. So it stayed in his garden uh, till the day he died. And uh, good 15 years ago, we went to the new forest in England and we scrounged it back. So it's now in Talbot House in the new permanent exhibition. And one, one fun thing we did, uh, an Aussie thing, for the anniversary of the Passchendaele campaign, a few years ago, right here in, in Passchendaele, where I'm at, we took the Tubby's hut, we positioned it on the remembrance field, and we served 4,000 cups of tea in a day to wow. all the pilgrims, all the relatives who came and visited. And there was a big gale of wind, and all the tents blew away. The one thing that kept standing was that old hut, 100 years old. <laughs> So uh, Prince Charles walked by and, uh, well, didn't, didn't have time for a cuppa, but uh, didn't know Talbot House. We are still, uh, we, from what we can gather, quite well known in the royal family as well because, well, their relatives came to the house as well. Our first patron was the Prince of Wales, so, uh, and the current one is the Queen, so they're, they're still, uh, it, it, it still resonates, let's say. Oh, it, um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a cool little story that, you know, is uh, it's, from you know, from um, from the first world war to now, that it's still yeah. That's, that's you know, it's a, it's it's it, it from Talbot House. Like I I I've been to Talbot House, and I've I'll, I'll let the listeners. I I went in September last year, and that's how I met Simon. And and it's it, for for everyone on 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 who's listening. If you can, you if you get a chance to go over to um, the battlefields of the Western Front, I really think it's something that you need to do. You know, it's 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 you you don't it's one thing to read it in books it's another thing to actually go and walk the ground and actually see um not just the cemeteries but obviously what we're talking about today the talbot house the you know behind the lines and actually go and you know see for yourself um the amazing you know what what um simon and and the other guides have done at talbot house is amazing the new museum is it's brilliant and like I like I've said um, on my Facebook page, um, Talbot House is actually going through a bit of um, it's at the moment with this coronavirus. It's going through uh, um, tough times, and as I was saying to Simon before we started the interview, it's we really need to get behind um, Talbot House and save um, Talbot House because it's it's got such history. And as Simon is telling you, it's it's an amazing story that. You know, it's we, we know about troops on the front line. We know about, you know, troops going over the top. We know what the trenches were like. We've, you know, we know what the battles were. But it's great to get stories of what the men did in their time in rest and behind the lines. And that's why, if we can, we really need to get behind Talbot House and save Talbot House. So, I... No, um, thank you. You're very right. Yeah. The, no, the current closure is, uh, has hit Talbot House quite hard. And... Uh, if you're under threat now of permanent closure, so that falls very hard on 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 myself, but also all our staff, the volunteers. Talbot House is mainly run by volunteers. It's a non-profit charity, yeah. And uh, leaving us without an income for the time being and for the foreseeable future as well. Um, we still have to pay for that exhibition. We have a lot of maintenance costs. You know, it's a 300-year-old house, um, and we we can't just fail on those men. Talbot House today is home from home still. So we have thousands of people from all over the world, from the Commonwealth mostly, coming to stay at the house, experiencing what it was like, having a cup of tea. Some of our volunteers are actually Australians as well, uh, even Kiwis. We have a former New Zealand Prime Minister who's one of our volunteers. And um, so it, it's people from all walks of life who, who find a place of belonging in the house. And um, it still has a role to play to that way. I think we owe it to those men, you know, to Tubby and all his Talbot houses to keep going. So that's why we started this GoFundMe page, this crowdfunding to raise enough money to make sure we can do another season next year and keep the place in, in good order. And yep. uh, we've also right. found that these are uh, Talbot houses. So uh, people who donate, become a member, become part of the family and get all sorts of perks, you know. Um, but really, you know, there's so many Australian stories. I really hope your listeners uh, will pay us a visit when they have the time. It's like you say, visiting the battlefields in general, it's those emotions you can't get in a classroom or from a book or even a TV show. It's seeing those graves, 
you know, walking the ground they walked, you know, and uh, as you did with Matt, you know, the he's he's a great guy, you know, the the way that whole thing works. It, for me, it was an eye opener as well last year. I was really glad to, to meet all of you. Uh, I think uh, Matt McLaughlin does a great job, you know, uh, with his company and uh, well, it's, it's and actually, honoring those men. It's actually great that you bring Matt into it as well, Simon, because he's actually hit hard times as well. He's he's actually, yes. he's um, you know he he's pretty much this whole year because uh, of Corona has pretty much uh, wiped him out and. Um, look, I, I think it will. I think it will come back. I think people, um, you know, I think it'll come back bigger and better. But as I said, we, you know, we need to keep Talbot House um, alive. And and we've we're we're not um, we're not to we've we've actually got um, a controversy back home here as well. We've got a um, a World War Two. Um, there's a walking. Um, so it's called the Kokoda um, Memorial Walking Track. Yes. And, it's actually um, it's actually under threat as well to close, and um, it's you know oh, wow. it's just it's yeah. just something that you know we, we really need to get behind these great you know they, they, I call them institutes because you know we, we it, it's history like we, without history we've got nothing and you know I, I think that we we need like we do the men um, you know we do if if we lose. Um, you know, Talbot House and we lose the Kokoda Memorial, We've, we're losing a massive chunk of our history and, and our, you know, and, and to the men and who sacrificed so much for all of our freedoms, you know, and especially in, you know, in, in the First World War and the Second. If we lose, if we lose um, Talbot House and, the, and you know, um, places like um, the Memorial Track, we're, we're, you know, we've, we may as well not, we may as well not do history because, you know, it's because of places like Talbot House and uh, the Kokoda Memorial Track um, that, you know, with them, we, you know, if, if we lose them, well, we may as well, you know, like we lose their stories and, you know, yes. like, and um, so with Talbot House, like when, do you have a fig an exact figure of, um, how many Australians actually came through the house or? Ah. So Tubby kept notes of everything and he asked people to write down the names in the chapel uh, as well. And um, sadly, a lot of those notes were stolen of, uh, from Tubby in the 1930s, I think in Manchester, and they ended up in the river. Uh, so uh, we, well, an awful lot of those archives were, are lost forever. But uh, we do know half, well, Toby always said half a million people visited the club, uh, a, a rough estimate during the war. So uh, you, we've you never said, said half calculated a half a million. Wow. So, um, yeah, yeah. But while there were, there were thousands of people going in and out every day uh, to, to, you know, to do many things, you know. And um, so we also know that... Um, well, we have far more Australian, far more many Australian stories, but also when Tubby uh, went back home, he realized there was a huge need for for help for veterans. There was nothing at the time, nothing. Okay, I know today it's not enough, but back then there just wasn't anything. So Tubby stepped in and he opened across the Commonwealth 500 Tock Age clubs, Talbot houses, including in Australia. Now, I've been emailing backwards and forwards with our Talk H Australia president the last few days. And uh, that, that side of things is still going strong in Australia. So the charity linked to Talbot House is still there. I think they have a good five branches still running in Australia, uh, in wow. various parts of that's, that's the country too. That, that's something that I didn't know. So no, yeah. That's, yeah, 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 yeah. And some of the volunteers from there then come and be a warden at Talbot House. Um, one of them, Ray, is uh, is an old pupil of Tubby's. He actually uh, served as his uh, Ed the Car's ADC for a while, and um, he's still uh, still going strong, Ray. So, wow. um, so yeah, yeah, lots of Australian links back then, you know, um, uh, and today Australians were great scroungers as well. So there's some artifacts linked to Australians in the house still today. Too, nothing's, so nothing, um, nothing's changed. We're still yeah, very much yeah, fun. and one thing. I, uh, I really love to start doing this year, but while we'll have to do it very small, is an Anzac Day service in our chapel as well. So uh, it's something we had planned. The embassies had committed to it, uh, but obviously we can't, we can't risk that. But we'll certainly be doing something uh, small 
on our social media for Anzac Day in the upper room in the chapel of Talbot House. There's so many Australians went came through, you know, um, there's, there's so many stories, you know, Australians weren't perhaps the most religious soldiers in World War One, but the, when you see how Tubby was able to appeal to them and to offer them hope, because that's what Talbot House is, it is hope. You, you go there and you try to find the hope you'll survive your next shift in the trenches. Um, you, you know, when everyone who visits goes to the pub, goes home afterwards, those men didn't go back home after a visit. They, they were stuck there and they had to go back to the trenches and they try and find the courage, the hope they'll survive another uh, time in the trenches. So uh, that's really what it is about. And we, we have to make sure we, we remember and respect that. And Anzac Day is such a good opportunity for that. So uh, I live next to Polygon Wood myself. So the dawn ceremony, I'm sure there will be something very small going on. It's cancelled officially as well, but... Uh, wouldn't surprise me if I hear the back five sort of bugle at the at the crack of dawn. It's uh, it's it's great you you know like I'm like for me growing up in Australia and being so passionate about military history. It's I'm I am so I'm so jealous of where you know where you live. It's it's you live in an amazing part of, of uh, you know of where a major event happened you know for four years and. Like for you, do you like growing up? Did you feel a sense of you know, um, like you had to learn the stories, or was it for you? Like what 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 sort of got you interested in um, Talbot House? Well, um, I uh, when my dad built his house, he keeps reminding me that I played football with one of the hand grenades they'd found, uh, <laughs> and now the house I'm speaking to you from, I just built last year. And uh, outside, we've got a pile of shells as well. And uh, I have to prevent my son from doing the same. So you, you can't hide, you know. If I look outside my window, I see the battlefields. I'm located on Anzac Ridge, Anzac House. It's, it's everywhere around us. But a lot of people still, uh, as you can imagine, I'm not sure, ignore it, you know, or it doesn't appeal to them. Now, um, I, I saw Australian students, you know, 14, 15 years old visiting who knew far more than I did. So that's about the age when I got interested. I started as a student in Talbot House and today I'm the manager. I'm still there half a lifetime away. And, um, but while Talbot House isn't a stranger in my family, it's where a mom and dad got together uh, 35 years ago. I got married there in the garden. So it, it, is, it is for us as well, home from home. Yeah, uh, I hope it is that the same for everyone. It's it's uh, See, it's when, owned by everyone. When you, I can hear it in your voice. When you when you talk about Tabard House, you, I can see that you're so passionate about it, and you know, you you really you can see it. Like I I, I can see it, you know. And we're we're doing, you know, um, we're we're talking via the internet, but I like I I'm privileged. I can actually see it in your in your face. And, you know, when you talk about Talbot House, it's, it lights up your face. I can really see that it's, you know, you, and it's, it's great to see that, you know, the, the, um, that you're so passionate and, you know, we can, um, you know, like it's, it's great to see and it's great to hear for the listeners as well, because, you know, like it's like, I, you know, like talking to Matt and, you know, other historians about, you know, World War One history, and all, like all, all wars, you know, it's, it's, it's you and I, we're the future generation that need to, you know, and, I, and like you said, you've got kids now, you need to, t you know, we're the, we're the, we're, we need to educate the future generations that are, that are coming through and tell them these stories of Talbot House, you know, and, and the First World War and, you know, we, and, you know, so that it's, the, their memory is not forgotten. Yes, yes, no, no, very important. Mm. I actually, today I have, was supposed to be guiding an Australian school. I guide a good 20 Aussie schools every year. And uh, so all of that f fell through as well. But uh, I feel very sorry for those kids because uh, that they, I'll, I'll share a little secret with you. My favorite schools to guide, uh, usually nationality wise, are always Australians because they are a wee bit older than some of the other groups. Yep. They're incredibly respectful. They are incredibly interested. Uh, they're very nice, very kind, very sweet. And um, I really, yeah, 
I miss the best part of the season <laughs> because my Australian schools are always real gems. So uh, they're a real credit to their country. Oh. And uh, like you say, it's so important that they they know these stories that they learn. And uh, trust me, they 99% of them are dead keen when they come here to find out more. And it does move them. It does do something with them. So these trips, the stuff Matt is doing, you know, it is so valuable um, for, for the next generation. They really need to know. Uh, and, and this, as I said, you can't learn this stuff in the classroom. No. You, you no, can no, only no. do so much. I used to be a teacher. You can only tell them so much. It's standing in front of that headstone of your great grandfather. You know, that, that's what does it. You know, that's when it clicks and when they realize, wow, this isn't the far from my bed show thing. You know, this is real life. And uh, it often gets very emotional for those young people still today. It's someone they've never met, but uh, it does something with them. And I think, I think also too, like for me, Simon, like I've been over to the Western Front three times now. And, and every time I go back, like I go back with a different um, purpose, but it's, you know, when, when you, like for me personally, when you, when you actually stand at a headstone and, it, and it's, you know, like, it, like I've, I had um, four relatives on the Allied side that were killed and I had six on the German side that were killed. Um, but when you stand at, at someone's, like when you stand at a, at a, at an unknown grave or a, or a, you know, someone like Mr. and Mrs. Smith of Ballarat, you know, you stand at, at um, you know, you stand at their son's grave and it, it, it's, you, you do feel like a sense of, um, like, you know, it's a pilgrimage and you're sort of completing the journey that they never got to complete. Like, and, and like, I guess, like you're saying, it for younger generations like who go over and actually do you know and walk in the footsteps of the Anzacs I feel that for them it's you know like it's a journey but it's it's you know like you said it's one thing to teach it but to actually stand there and, and look at the and and see the cost of you know and and and, yes. the, and the scale the scale that was you know that was uh that was the first world war and and you know like and 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 there was more than you know just australia and there was you know new zealand there was um great britain there all these other like little countries that were involved and you and you see the global like you see on a global scale um, what the actual, what the First World War cost. And, you know, and it's, it's not until you actually stand with, 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 where you're standing next to three um, headstones where you've got, you know, you've got a South African, you've got a, a British and you've got a, an Australian or, and a New Zealand. And you see them side by side and you, it's, it's not like, yes, you can read it in a book, but when you actually stand there, you look and you go, wow, I, I just, yes. I, I can't. Yes. I can't get over the sacrifice of, um, you know, of what these men gave for all of us. And, you know, and for what I feel sometimes today is the freedom that's taken it, you know, it's taken for granted, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's something that, you know, not, not all, not, not, all, not everyone takes it for granted, but I feel there are, there's without, you know, the likes of Talbot House and, you know, and us telling the story, you know, keeping the story of the First World War, you know, I, I feel that we, we may lose, um, you know, people and they, they won't, um, like they, they, they won't, like they take the freedom that they've got in their own countries for granted. And, you know, but um, with like what today with Talbot House, what, um, what can people do um, when they come to Talbot House? Like what, um, obviously like we can, um, like, can you can you still have a cup of tea? Can you can you stay at Talbot House? Can you like? Can yeah, yeah. Us? Well, one thing before I'll get into that is what I always tell the kids when they uh, visit the cemeteries is uh, I ask everyone to stand in front of a random headstone and then uh, have a look if it's known or unknown, and you know, uh, sit down if it's unknown. And you only see a handful of people actually standing up. Most people on Tynecott Cemetery, just outside my window here. Most people are unknown. Uh, we don't know where they're buried. And you, you mentioned the journey. Well, I always tell the people, think of it a different way. You, you're emotional seeing him. Imagine for a moment how he feels about vi your visit. He hasn't had a personal visit in perhaps a century. 
you know, your great grandfather has been lying here in a Belgian field, the other side of the globe, you know, uh, with people walking past every day, no one stopping at that headstone. Now, for the first time in a century, perhaps, he's heard his name called by a relative. He's been called back home. What do you think that means to him? That's why we need to do it. Not just for the future generations. I think we owe it to these guys that they get a visit from time to time. Dave, so, that, um, that's my... Yeah. You've you just hit the nail on the head. For me, that was... Um, like that was like my dad and I, we completed, uh, luckily for me, all my four uh, relatives on the Allied side, well, actually all, all of my relatives, even the uh, six on the German side, they, yes. they're remembered in uh, Langemark Cemetery. And oh, wow. all six. Wow. Yeah, all six, yep. So they're all, all six are remembered in uh, Langemark Cemetery, so, um, which was lucky um, because obviously, as you know, the Germans weren't, um, you know, they... They weren't, um, they didn't get a, some got a proper burial, but most, most didn't. Um, but I was, I was very lucky because my, um, my dad and I actually got to complete a pilgrimage that started at Gallipoli in 2015 when we went on Matt's um, tour uh, to, wow. the, to the centenary of Anzac Day at Gallipoli. And we had a relative that was killed at Gallipoli and we got to see his grave and that was, that was, that was an amazing experience. But um, his little brother was actually killed on the Western Front in uh, 1916 on the Somme. He was killed on the first day. And um, we actually got, last year, we actually got to complete um, the pilgrimage and we, we actually got to stand at his grave. And also my other two great, great uncles that um, when... I didn't know they were over there and then I did some research um, so from the previous year when I was there in 2018 to when I went there last year I uh, found out that they were that uh, I had two other relatives that were that were killed and they were actually the cousins of the two that were killed uh, one at Gallipoli and the one at uh, okay. um, and um, the uh, lo long story short the um, one, so the, the other cousin, he was killed two days after he, uh, the cousin on the Western, on, on, at the Somme. He was killed on the 25th at, at uh, Poziers. So they were both killed at Poziers. And his older brother was actually killed at um, Mont Saint Quentin in, in 1918. And, and he, um, he died 18 days before the Anzacs were pulled out of the fighting. And we've been to all their graves. And it's, and um, we finished, we completed the journey last year and, and went with Matt um, to their graves. And for the, you know, we were the first in the family in 103 years to actually wow. go, to go to their graves. And I'll never forget the, I'll never forget that experience of completing all four and going to all four graves. And it's, it's just an amazing experience and, and the feeling of, of pride that I had, especially considering that I, I did it with my dad. Like it was an amazing yeah. experience to, you know, for a father and son to be side by side and, you know, and really embrace. And it was, it was an emotional experience and yeah. it was, you know, and it, thank, and it was all because of Matt, you know, Matt was, Matt made it happen. And, you know, yeah. obviously we, us going on the tours, but, um, you know, Matt really helped us, and I, I, like you said, to re, uh, to you know, to reinforce, if people do get the chance, they really do need to go over and actually. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. They, they need to. Yeah. Maybe. And yeah. It's, uh, and, and as you were asking, you know, Talbot House it is uh, still today. It's home from home, so people can browse through our new exhibition, set to open as soon as this crisis is over, um, where you can find out the 100 year history of Talbot House. So we've included the first pilgrimages. Uh, we've included the Second World War in that. Uh, there's, and, and the rest of it, you know, there's an original concert hall with a, an original concert party from back then as well. Um, and the, the house is really an authentic place. An awful lot of the things you see on the Western Front have been recreated or put in place after the war. There's very few original things from back then left. Now, when you walk through our garden into Talbot House, into the, up to the stairs to that chapel, you really get that sense of, of um, you're walking in their footsteps, you're walking into history. Everywhere you're looking around, you see photographs of the men, you see their notes, they scribbled the names they left behind on the walls. It's 
it's everywhere. It's a very special place. And still today, it is, it is, it is three things officially. Uh, well, two things officially. It is a living museum. It is a guest house, so you can stay the night. You can have a cooked breakfast and all that. It's a great place to stay. But it is home. It's a meeting place. Uh, people just walk in every day, you know, for a cup of tea, have a chat with our volunteers from across the globe, uh, do a bit of maintenance, you know, help out or come to a lecture or a movie or a concert. Um, and for a lot of people, it really is a, an important place in their lives. I can actually uh, say that I've met a few people in my lifetime who have assured me that Talbot House saved their lives. They weren't mentally doing well. And uh, having that place of belonging, that home uh, where someone did care about you, that, that is Talbot House. I'll never forget the night that one of our uh, volunteers, uh, Jerry from Yorkshire, opened the door. It had gone six o'clock on a Sunday evening and outside was a vagrant uh, dropped off by the police. Social services were full for the night. Can you put him up? And uh, without a blink, without a hesitation, Jerry pulled the guy in. He got him some chips. They put him in the shower. They got him a bed, a bed for the night. He stayed there two nights and he walked out a changed man. And, um, you know, that, that says something, you know, an awful lot of hotels or institutions would, you know, ooh, be a bit hesitant, ask questions. In Talbot House, every man's club, uh, run on the Robin Hood principle, you know, uh, everyone gives what they can, you know, if it's financially great, if it's in another way, your time, your effort, like you're doing on the podcast today, that's, that's, that's the great beauty of it. Everyone contributes in one way or another. That's how we keep it going. Um, and uh, let's hope we can still do that for a, a long, long time to come. So um, we've been through the numbers and sadly that crowdfund that target also we put up that that's the actual number. We're still looking what we can do to decrease the costs. When I'm finished with this podcast, I've got more meetings on the accountancy, but it is, um, it is, it's in a very bad shape and it's very stressing for all our volunteers because people think, Oh, it's, they're doing this crowdfund, you know, they're making a lot of noise for nothing. Perhaps, you know, it is, it's Simon again. Uh, and sadly wow. this time it is bloody serious. No, uh, sadly, wrong. this time we we are we cannot assure people we'll still be there next year. Wow. So, but well, we we have every confidence our friends, fans, Talbot Townsend will pull us uh, out of this uh, misery and put uh, the house back on track. So, so uh, we uh, hope we can do that. For the listeners, is there a um, is there a, a, like a website where we can you know or the can you can you give the listeners um, the the website and the, and the GoFundMe page so that um, if when they do, um, you know, like obviously everyone's, you know, struggling, but I, as I said, of course, uh, and through this, through this chat, um, as you can tell, it's, you know, we can't lose Talbot House. And if you can, can you just, can you give, um, of course, there's a, like where they can go to donate and it doesn't have to be a mate, like, you know, whatever they can spare just to, just to keep Talbot House alive. So um, it is, we've, we've started the crowdfund on GoFundMe. So that's GoFundMe. And then you look for Talbot House, save Talbot House. But you can find lots of updates on our social media. So what we're doing uh, with this podcast and others as well is trying to keep the house open virtually. So you can go on our website, on the social media. There's daily videos, stories of Talbot House. It's, you know, we do not close down. Just like Tubby 100 years ago, you cannot stop us. We want to keep telling these stories one way or another. And um, you're very right, Adam. There's far more serious things happening in the world right now than, than a soldiers club from a century ago, you know. But Tubby left us a quote, and um, I think it's an interesting one. He said, losing this spirit wouldn't have helped us winning the war, but it would have made it less worth winning. Now, beating coronavirus is essential. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and saving Talbot House will not contribute to that anyway. But imagine if we can beat Corona and save Talbot House at the same time, how amazing would that be that a hundred years from now, this symbol of hope is still there. Absolutely. So that's, that's what, how Tubby looked at it. And I think uh, it's how we look at it as well. You know, we don't want to give in. No, no, that's, and I don't think that you, um, I don't think that you should because it's, um, you know, like, as you say, it's, it's, yes, it's an every man's club, but it's, it's even today it's it's a sign of hope 
it's you know it's still a sign of hope and and you know um like we said you know if we lose it we're going to lose um more than you know we're going to lose more than history we're going to lose a place of hope and you know it's it's that's the thing that you know and mate that's why i wanted to get you on and have a chat about you know talbot house and so um can you just quickly uh, going off topic can you so what after after the war um what happened to tubby where did like where did tubby like where did he go and, and what did he um did did he you know did like uh, once he left the club and the war was over um what did he do for the rest of his life so tubby uh christmas 1918 he bought um uh a typewriter of someone and he complained about the price so the end of the debate was that the man gave him the typewriter for free he quit his job and he went to work with tubby <laughs> that's how persuasive the man was and they wrote christmas cards 2000 asking people would you be interested in a talbot house in london town so that's how they opened their first talbot house or in singular school code talk h club in the in the uk and gradually it grew so um one thing led to another and uh, a year later they had uh, a few of these houses uh, and by the end of the decade i think they had something like ten thousand members across the commonwealth so Tubby's devoted his life to his former soldiers to make sure they were mentally doing okay and that, well, in any way possible, he would assist them and their families. So he organized pilgrimages to the Western Front so he could show the widows and the veterans the graves of their loved ones. Um, he would travel to Australia to found Tokage houses there as well. He went to Canada. Um, one of his sister organizations, Amor, in, in uh, the United States, uh, a few years ago, built 10,000 homes for homeless people. So it is still going strong in some parts of the world. Wow. Um, all, you know, subgroups from subgroups, that is. Uh, all starting at Talbot House. So in World War II, uh, he insisted to be part of it. So he volunteered to be a padre on one of the oil tankers crossing the Atlantic many times. Can you imagine the sheer danger he put himself in, you know, without any need? Yes. Um, so he lived next to the Tower of London. That was where his parish was at. There's a small church there, uh, all hallows by the tower, next to the Tower of London. Do go and have a look next time you're there. It's steeped in history. And he was assisted there whilst living there by his Batman, Arthur Pettifer, the same guy as in the war, who you know wouldn't have it any other way. And every evening he would have a meal, let's say, with eight people. Eight people. And let's say there was a spare seat on the table, but he had the Prince of Wales and the Chancellor of the Exchequer on a visit. And he would say to Petrifer, there's a spare seat, go and find me someone. So he would walk in with the guy putting on the lights, you know, in his old dust, dust coat, sitting next to the Prince of Wales. My house, my rules. <laughs> so his last official posting was as a um, confessor to the late Queen Mother. So he was very close to the royal family as well. And... Um, when he actually did pass away, he was buried at All Hallows by the Tower, his church. And apparently on the BBC channels, on all channels, you have to try and imagine this, everything went in black, black screen, no broadcast for two long minutes before the announcement came that the Padre of the Trenches, Tubby Clayton, the father of the boys, had passed away. So the nation was really in shock because he, you know, and, and, and the Commonwealth, because he was so loved and so revered as a, as a normal guy, one of the, you know, uh, yeah, did so much, who meant so a much. True larrikin, a, a true larrikin, a true as, yeah. larrikin, as the Aussie, yeah. you know, in the Aussie terms, larrikin. a true larrikin. And, you know, he, um, but it, it sounds like, you know, from what you've said, he, um, he was just, um, you know, like he, he just had a, a way with the men that they could all, um, you know, they all, and they all entrusted in, in, in Tubby. Like they, you know, they, they, and, you know, like for the men, obviously, you know, getting away from the horrors of the, of the trenches. And I guess for them, it was just an escape. And, and, and I guess in a way, Tubby just offered a, um, you know, a, a, a lending an ear to them and, and, you know, whatever they were thinking. And it just, to me, he, he just sounds like a, a fantastic man. And just, you know, from the stories that you've told, mate, he, he's, you know, and we should know more about him. We really should, um, you know, and then, and, and, and lots of books. <laughs> yeah. And, but, 
you know, hence why, you know, Talbot House is so important to obviously keep Tubby's legacy going on. And, and you know, um, it's really, you know, it's something that I think um, future generations um, should know the story of Tubby. Yeah, yeah. Well, he wrote many books, you know, uh, in his lifetime, many, many books. And uh, we've, let's say, went through a lot of them and we've compiled a few very good ones, thick and thin ones, on our online shop in Talbot House as well. So people can actually order these uh, from us uh, on, through the Facebook shop and they can, uh, they can find out lots more. Because whenever I read Tubby's stories set in World War One, you think it's all tragedy, doom and gloom. It's not. It's it's bloody hilarious. The the, the, <laughs> the stories he recounts. It is really. It's comedy. World War One almost. Absolutely. What he gets up to, you know. Um, yeah. It's it's amazing, you know. And and so during um, so moving away from the First World War with um, obviously because you you um, poor old Belgium had uh, two world wars go through through its uh, through its borders. Um, what happened to obviously when the Germans uh, occupied uh, Belgium in World War Two? What happened to Talbot House during World War Two? Was it was it closed or what? Um, yeah, what actually happened to Talbot House in the Second World War? So Talbot House was um, chosen to be a hub for all British expats living in the area as an evacuation centre in 1939, and um, it was actually used as such. Uh, on the evacuation towards Dunkirk. We still have a room named after Dunkirk. So those people mainly would have been uh, gardeners and office staff of the Commonwealth, or back then the Imperial War Graves Commission. So there's some great accounts there as well of um, those gardeners on the run with their families and everything they can carry, walking into Talbot House and not being able to leave and flee to Dunkirk and England before they've attended to the garden. Can you imagine, you know, we, could, we couldn't, you know, leave our beautiful English garden looking like this when Jerry walks in. So after they were all evacuated, the caretakers, a be lovely Belgian couple, had, you know, well, had to uh, allow the Germans into their town. Now, a short while later, the Germans did occupy the town, uh, the, the house. And um, so the night before the caretakers were briefed, they would be occupied. So overnight, the local people, resistance people and, and other people, ransacked the house, got everything that reminded of the British occupation, you know, of the, the British heritage, out of the house, buried in their gardens. A lot of it was tucked away, saved. And um, the Germans that occupied the house used it as a communication center, mainly for the German Navy, the Kriegsmarine. And um, there's lots of, if you listen to some other guides, you'll hear stories of like, alo alo, you know, there were airmen in the garden, the Gestapo was in the house, there was a brothel on the second floor. None of that is true. <laughs> the, but we do have some very interesting stories and artifacts. Um, now, uh, one of them is a, a German officer who was too lazy to call for his aid whenever he needed him. So he took his Luger and shot in the ceiling. So we still see those bullet holes in the, underneath the plaster today. Um, now, one of the German veterans actually paid us a visit in 1992. He left his notes, and uh, I can give you, uh, tell you a little secret. His daughter is coming to open our new exhibition when oh, we wow. are allowed to open. And she's going to do that together with the daughter of a British serviceman, a tanky, who liberated us in 1944. So uh, we want to be a center of peace and reconciliation, bringing the two Absolutely. daughters together where their fathers stood at each other's throats. Now, um, um, the day we were liberated, we had this huge liberation party. Uh, there was a BBC correspondent driving along with the Polish tanks. And uh, the fact that Belgium had been liberated, yes, a footnote. Talbot House, Tok H is back open and running. And, you know, it didn't take Tubby very long to get down to Talbot House. And they were serving cups of tea and uh, Montgomery paid a visit. And yeah, the whole thing, you know, got pretty interesting very quickly. Um, this British club, you know, uh, that they'd all known from the first war uh, had been left more or less untouched. All the relics reappeared and the house started anew. Um, so that's really what we want to do when we have beaten this corona bastard. Uh, we can uh, do a liberation party of our own, Absolutely. reopen the house officially 
Yeah. Uh, because this has been our first closure since, you know, we've never closed since 1944. We just haven't. So uh, the last warden, Mark, a uh, good buddy of mine who closed the house, he always had tears in his eyes, you know, and he did that. It's, it's unthinkable. He's an ex-serviceman himself and he, he couldn't, you know, it's, we, we yeah. can't have it being shut, you know, it's just against the nature of the thing. Oh, absolutely. It's, you know, it's, it's you know, and, and who would have thought a simple virus that would, you know, would grind <laughs> up, would, would virtually grind the world to a halt. Like it's, yeah. you know, and, and it's, you know, especially coming into, you know, like it would have been, this year would have been very busy for you guys because, you know, like um, obviously we're going into your, you were going into your summer. So, you know, um, it would have been, you know, and this is the time, this is the period where you guys make, your, you know, you make most, of yes. your, most of your money to keep. That, that's uh, exactly it. Going, yes. and, you know, it's and who would have thought, you know, like we, you know, we would have, you know, like when we were there in September, we, you know, we were like, oh, it's amazing, you know, this is fantastic, and you know, like six months later, we're talking that, you know, we're, we're we we may lose Talbot House altogether, and it's just it's very sad to hear, but. Um, mate, it's it's been fantastic to you know um, get you on the show and and really you know step back in time and, and talk about a a period of time that I feel um, is forgotten and I, mate, I, all I can do is say thank you for you know giving up you know we've almost spoken for an hour I mean we could we could go on you know probably for another <laughs> four hours but um, I know you're a busy man and. Um, but no, I really do appreciate you giving your time.